The topics for today are tips for communicating effectively using Blackboard. It's part of our Blackboard tips series, and we try to show people different options for using the variety of tools available on Blackboard. My name is Yvonne Johnson, and I am the Multimodal Teaching Coordinator for Faculty Development. And that means that I help people with teaching um, and strategies related to face-to-face, -face, as well as online teaching scenarios. So if you have a question about face-to-face -face or blended or online, I'm happy to help you. I also teach research and educational technology courses as an instructor on a part-time basis for the educational technology research and um, assessments department. So um, could you introduce yourselves just so that we kind of have an idea of who's online? Um, Isabel, could you let us know your name and department and your experience using Blackboard? You can type it into the chat box, please. OK, great. Um, so you have um, taught many online classes. That's great. And Stephanie is online. She is our assistant director for faculty development. And she is providing technical support and sharing expertise throughout the session today. So thank you for your help, Stephanie. OK, so let's talk a little bit about why we use communication tools. One of the reasons that we use communication tools in um, online learning communities is to establish an instructor presence. And I've done research on this um, for the past about 10 or 15 years, and I use those different techniques in my class. And I've found that is very important for instructors working with online students to ensure that the student knows that the professor is present and available and engaged in the learning community. So we'll talk about different techniques for doing that um, using Blackboard today. And it, you know, obviously, it is easy to establish a presence with a face-to-face -face class, but there are many, many tools that we can use to establish that instructor presence and support for the students online. Another reason that we use communication tools is to increase engagement in the online community. So we'll look at different tools and how you could possibly use them to keep the students engaged in the learning community, to help them collaborate with each other, and to work independently, and to build that engagement in the online learning community. We also use communication tools to support collaboration among students. Um, and there are a variety of Blackboard tools that can help you facilitate that collaboration amongst students and groups in your learning community. Another reason that we use communication tools is to facilitate extended conversations about specific topics. So you might address a topic in an initial synchronous session or in a face-to-face -face class. And then you can use the Blackboard tools to extend that conversation and the discussions beyond that synchronous time when you talked about those topics. So it's a way to support different um, styles of learning for students. Some people like time to reflect and analyze. And so if the conversation is extended, they have more time to uh, formulate their responses and share them in the, the learning community. So um, do either of you have any other ideas about why communication tools um, could be used in Blackboard online courses or how you might help um, engage the students? OK, all right. So, so exchanging ideas, yes, that's an excellent um, suggestion. and. Um, sharing information through dialogue and participation. Yes, those are all great ideas for how you could use communication tools that are available in Blackboard. Thank you. OK, um, we often refer to different resources to help us learn about 
um, students' needs and different strategies for continuing to increase our effectiveness in online education. And the Faculty Focus is a great resource that you can use if you're a professor. Um, and one of the articles shared five things that online students want from faculty. So one of the things that online students want is they want quick responses. We live in a time when people are accustomed to um, using mobile devices and sharing information very rapidly and responding rapidly um, to people with text messages or other um, communication tools. So students have come to expect quick responses when they're in online um, classes. So it's important to let them know what they can expect in, in um, relationship to your response time. So if your response time is that you would respond within 12 hours or 24 hours or whatever, it's a good idea to put that in the syllabus so that students know what to expect and then they um, then when you respond within that time frame, their expectations are met. They also want instructor presence. So we want to make sure that when we're using an online environment that the instructor is present in that. The students need to know that they're connected with the instructor and the instructor is available. So those um, parameters relate to instructor presence. Students also want reminders. Um, so one of the strategies I use is I sort of set up a rhythm in my class and I'll provide reminders on a regular systematic basis and that's to sort of get the students in a rhythm of the course and they stay engaged and it improves um, their learning experience. Students also want easy access to course design. They don't want to have to go and um, spend a lot of time trying to navigate through Blackboard to find um, what they're looking for. So we can use communication tools to help them have easy access in the course design and show them where they need to go so that they can quickly get to those areas of the course and meet um, their expectations in the course successfully. They also want fun and interesting discussion format. So there are different ways that you can engage students and make the online environment fun and engaging. So um, that's something to keep in mind. So in terms of expectations of online students, what they want from faculty, does anybody have anything else that they want to add in terms of what students want from faculty when they're engaged in an online course? Okay. Okay. So let's move on to. Oh, that's that's a good point, um, Isabel. So okay, and Stephanie. Um, Okay. All right. You raised some interesting points, Isabel. And um, I think, okay, so you're raising the point that um, some students might think that um, an online course is more of an independent study. So, um, and they might not uh, be as interested in participating. So those are good points. And one of the things that you can do to to help students understand how you're going to teach the course is that in your syllabus you can explain um, the format of the course, how you're going to have them participate, the uh, points that they will get for these different activities, and that there is significant research that shows that engagement in um, among students in the learning community and between the students and the instructor is a much more effective online teaching and learning environment than if the students just go off independently and complete the course. So you can explain that in the syllabus and maybe that will help with some of that, but there is quite a bit of research to show that 
um, the techniques that we share help um, students be more successful in the course. But that's a very good point, Isabel. Thank you for raising those issues. OK, so today, just to um, give you a highlight of what I'm going to talk about. OK, um, yes, and Isabel, in terms of the um, reading the syllabus, one of the things that you can do is you can actually make um, an activity that is related to reading the syllabus. And so you can create some sort of a um, small assignment activity that asks questions and it, that would require students to actually um, delve into the syllabus and find the answers. And so that's one way that you can sort of get them to um, read about what the expectations are. So that's a good point. OK, so in terms of the agenda for today, we're going to be talking about tips for using the email features in Blackboard, talk about tips for announcements features in Blackboard, tips for using asynchronous discussions in Blackboard. We'll also look at blogs, wikis, journals, and how you might um, consider using them in your Blackboard course. And we'll talk about tips for synchronous presentations and discussions using Blackboard. And then at the end, we'll have um, time for questions in case any issues um, that you still have questions about. OK, so in terms of the email features, let me give you some tips, and then we'll look at the interface. Um, one of the things that is important when you're using email in um, Blackboard is if you compose the emails in a word processor, then you can save them for future use. So what I do is I set up folders for all the courses that I teach, and I compose the emails in the folders and put them in module folders if, if I have modules for the course, and then post them in Blackboard. Um, and share them so that you have them saved for future use. You can email students from the Blackboard system, and so you don't have to go out of the system to communicate with students. One of the things to remember is that you, it's important to save copies of your Blackboard emails in a folder on whatever email system you're using. So if you're using GroupWise, save a copy of the Blackboard email in GroupWise, or save it in Outlook 365 if you're using that email. Because when you send an email from Blackboard, one of the things you need to remember is that it's not saved in your sent file. There's not a sent box for email in Blackboard. So just save it um, for yourself, and then you'll have it for future use or reference. Another tip for effectively using email with Blackboard is that you can email students about their assessments or deficiencies or um, issues that come up. And you can do this directly from the Grade Center. And that's a, a very good tool, and it's a quick tool. You don't have to leave the Grade Center and go into email. You can just send the email from the Grade Center. And one of the recommendations is to avoid using the built-in messages tool for Blackboard. Um, it's better to use the email tool. OK, so we will look at the screenshot of the email tool on Blackboard. But basically, the steps are that when you're in Blackboard, you look at the toolbars, you look at the control panel. As an instructor, you have a control panel. Students don't have those tools in Blackboard. So you go to the control panel. Select Course Tools, go to Course Management, and then you go through the steps. When you're in the Course Tools, you can select Send an Email, and then you decide which option um, you want to send the email. And I'll show you that in just a second. So when you click on the Send Email tool, there are many different options. So you can send email to all of the users. 
if you have groups set up, I don't know if you use groups in um, the art courses. If you do, you could send emails to some of the groups. You could send emails to all users. Or you can decide if you want to send emails to individual users. So you can see there are a lot of different ways that you can use the email tool in Blackboard. So this is a, a screenshot of what the email tool would look like. If you send it to all users, if you clicked on the all users link, then you would get this type of an interface. Just type in the email, click submit, and the email is sent. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, sending email from the Blackboard Grade Center is a wonderful tool for instructors. I use it all the time. So you go under the course management menu again, which is something that the students don't have. Scroll to the Grade Center. You click on the full Grade Center. And as you know, if you've taught a lot of Blackboard classes, the full Grade Center has all of the information for all the students enrolled in your class. So then on the left-hand side of the list of the students in the roster, you click on the box next to the student that you want to send an email to, or if there are a few students, click on all of their names. And then you put in the text just like you would any other email, and you send it. You can also send emails to um, users or observers. Sometimes there are co-instructors for courses or observers, so you can do that from the Grade Center as well. So Isabel, do you have any strategies that you use for using email in Blackboard? OK. All right, that's awesome. OK. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. You use a lounge. That's a great tip for um, engaging students in, in a discussion board in a class. OK. So you use the NIU regular email. OK. Great. OK, thank you. OK. So another tool that is that I use quite a lot when I teach is the announcements tool in Blackboard. Some of the um, tips for being successful with the announcements, again, create the announcements in the word processor and save them for future use. Post important announcements or news as those issues come up in the announcements tool. And then you can also send an email to students. And one of the benefits of that is that you post the announcement so it stays in the course, and then you also send an email. So the students sort of get the information two different ways. And even if they delete the email after they've read it, and let's say that it's been a period of time and they've forgotten, it's still available in the announcements um, section on the Blackboard course. So, so that's a way to make sure that the information is still there in case it gets um, deleted or they forget later down the road. Another important technique is when you do prepare a s announcements in Blackboard, if you inc include the course links in the announcement, then the student can click on that link and go directly to the section of the course that you're making the announcement related to. So I set up modules when I design my courses, and I'll have a welcome announcement to the module. And in that module, in the welcome announcement, I'll include the link to the module. The students can click on that link to whatever module it is and go directly to the module. And that connects with the ease of access to information, which is one of the things that students want when they're engaging in a an online course. Another important um, thing to remember is, is save copies of your announcements, because if you get in a situation where you teach a course, maybe every other semester or every semester, then you have um, saved information in the announcements that you can use again and then just refine or revise them for the next semester so you don't have to start from scratch all the time. And then as the uh, slide says, you would change the dates and then post the announcements in the new course. 
Okay, so this is a similar interface. You to post an announcement, you look at the control panel, you go to the tools, click on announcements, um, check the edit mode when you're adding things to a course, you always make sure the edit mode is on, and then create the announcement. So this is um, a screenshot of an announcement, and one of the things that I do um, in terms of setting up a rhythm in my course is I use the announcements tool. So for every module, first I'll have a welcome to the course announcement. It has key information about the course. And then each week or every two weeks, depending upon how the course is set up, I will have a welcome to module one, welcome to module two, et cetera. And then it will have all the information, lesson objectives, et cetera, for um, assignments for the module. So that, that announcement would be posted the first day of the module. And then midweek, I would send a reminder an announcement because I probably have discussion assignments due on Thursday of the week. So if the module starts on Sunday, then I would send a reminder announcement on Wednesday reminding them that they have discussions due on Thursday and then assignments due on Sunday. And then I'll have a uh, welcome announcement for the next week. So the students start to expect these pieces of information. I send them at the same time in the module. And so they get into a rhythm of the course. And they're more likely to be successful in terms of planning their time and submitting their um, assignments and activities on time. OK. All right. Oh, good. OK. So you use announcements for special holidays. That's a great idea. Thank you for sharing that, Isabel. OK. And you can see in here there's the course link. As I mentioned, um, that's a good way to set up assign um, announcements. OK, and this is the interface. So you click on sending the email when you're posting the assignment. Do you send the emails when you're posting um, announcements, Isabel? Do you use that feature? Yes, OK, great. OK. OK, so um, one of the tips you had was for special holidays posting announcements, that's great. That's a great way to personalize the course and to bring in um, significant events occurring. That's a great idea. Thank you for sharing that, Isabel. OK, so we talked a little bit about asynchronous discussions. Isabel, I know you said that you have a lounge. And so we'll talk a little bit about asynchronous discussions. So the discussion board in Blackboard is a great tool. And it's an asynchronous format because the students are participating in the discussions at different times. One best practice for uh, creating discussions is that you can create a help form. And you can have students post general questions there instead of um, sending emails to you as the instructor. And the reason a help form is a valuable tool is because when you as the instructor answer the student's question in the help form, then all of the students in the course um, receive the answer. OK, um, so let me talk about the subscription to the help form. OK, so. Isabel, you said when you post announcements or other information, you send an announcement. Is that what you were um, referring to in that last comment? OK, all right. That's a great idea. Because then students know that you've posted the grades, you put an announcement out, they know to check their grades. That's a great, a great technique. Thank you. OK, so in terms of subscriptions, the advantage of enabling subscriptions to the help forum is that you have created this help area on the discussion board. And so when students post something there, that means they have a question or they need some assistance. So that would be a form that you would want to subscribe to. And then you'll get an email. So if you have emails, um, 
set up on your phone, then you get the notification that somebody posted a um, question in the help form and that you need to go in and answer it because, you know, it's a, um, making sure that students have their needs met. Okay, so you subscribe to the help form so that you're notified. Yes, that's exactly correct. Um, that's a very good point, Stephanie. Thank you for sharing that. So Stephanie said that she subscribes to the help forum so that she knows if students posted a question, then she doesn't have to actually go into the course. She can just check it from her email on her phone or iPad or whatever. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. So Isabel, does that make sense in terms of subscribing to the um, help forum? One different kind of student. Well, um, Isabel, you have, well, as um, you're asking a question about the subscriptions, when, when you as an instructor set up a discussion board, you can set up if you want people to be able to subscribe or not. So, so if you don't want them to be able to subscribe, then you just don't set that up when you create the discussions. Um, but in terms of the um, help forum, that's an important one for you as the instructor to subscribe to. But that's a very good point, Isabel. Um, you want the students to be regularly checking the course. So when you set up the discussions, just don't enable that subscription for students on the regular discussion boards. That's a very good point. And thank you for that information, Stephanie, as well. And Another thing that you can do with asynchronous discussions is you can create a social forum for an off-topic discussion. So students might find that they have similar interests, similar hobbies, and they could talk about those types of topics in the social forum rather than taking the um, course module topics off-topic. Okay. All right. Thank you uh, for the clarification, Isabel. Great. Okay, and in terms of the discussion boards, it's important to specify the due dates for the required contributions and to keep the students regularly engaged in the course, and this connects with what you were saying, Isabel, and trying to keep them checking regularly. It's a good idea to stagger the due dates for the discussions. So if the module opens on Sunday, then you could have their initial posts for the discussions due on Wednesday or Thursday, then you could have their responses to uh, their fellow students due on Saturday or Sunday, and you can decide if you want them to have to contribute several times um, on different dates, and these are strategies for helping you keep the students engaged. And it's a good idea to um, include the dates for the discussion posts in the form description. And, and I do that and I post them in a bolder font and so that it's obvious to the students when their various discussion posts are due. Um, another thing that you can do is you can make the discussion forms available as needed. So if you have eight different modules in the course, you might make those module discussion boards available when the module opens, so that you're kind of keeping students focused on the topics for a specific module, they're discussing, they're completing their activities related to that topic, and then when that module is finished, they move on to the next topic and build upon the information that they gained in the previous modules. So you don't have to open up all the discussion boards at once. You can stagger them with your course modules. Another suggestion in terms of dis asynchronous discussions is when you order them online, if you have the, new, the oldest discussions on the bottom. So the first discussion would be at the bottom of the page, and then when you construct the course, you put the, the next, the newer discussion above that. And so when a student accesses the discussion board, they see the most current information at the top of the page. They don't have to scroll down. If you have a 16-week uh, course, you could have to scroll down quite a lot. So you want them to see the current information at the top of the discussion board. And it's a good idea to leave the past discussion boards on 
the discussion board so that the students can look at that. And if they want to refer to prior information, they can access that throughout the course. You can also allow them to supplement um, text communications with audio. And I've had students even post videos for discussion boards. And so, um, or they can add attachments. And so that's a way to use different types of um, media to engage them and make the discussions more interesting. Um, the We have um, separate sessions on um, audio. Um, Stephanie, could you um, elaborate on the audio a bit? Sure, I'll use my microphone if you don't mind. Um, Thank you. Isabel, there are two tools that I'll just briefly mention uh, that can both be used in conjunction with the discussion board that would allow students to record either audio or video and post that to the discussion board in addition to or instead of uh, typing out a, a text response. One is Video Everywhere, which I had a few students use in the last course that I taught. They actually recorded videos of themselves as their discussion board response. Um, it, records directly through Blackboard. It does store the video on the student's YouTube account, but as a, an unlisted video, so it's not public on their profile, and then embeds it in the course so that others can watch it. The other tool is the Helix Media Server, where, yes, as you say, students would record the audio or a video ahead of time and then can post it to the discussion board through the, the mashup tool and choosing Helix Media Server. Either of those give a, a great way for students to and go beyond the, um, the basics of what they may feel restricted to with text communication. Uh, those are in, so when you're posting a discussion forum um, on the text box editor itself, there is an option for a mashup. So both of them, the Video Everywhere and the Helix, are essentially embedded in the course, but the files themselves are outside of the course. So the, the um, audio player would show up on the discussion forum in the student's response, but the audio file itself is not in the course. Does that make sense, I hope? I see you're typing a response. Yes, definitely follow up with us offline. Okay. Uh, Dan Cabrera, our multimedia coordinator, is our Helix and Video Everywhere specialist. So I would definitely recommend you get in touch with him. OK, thank you, Stephanie. Um, does that help, Isabel? OK, thank you. OK, so um, Isabel, you're probably very familiar with how to um, identify the discussion boards and create them online. It's important to look at the different options available when you're creating the discussion board. And one of the things that you mentioned earlier was that um, subscriptions. So if you don't want students to be able to subscribe to a discussion board, then you just don't enable that when you're creating the discussion board. You can also use rubrics um, when you're creating the discussion boards. Um, and it's a good idea not to allow anonymous posts because you want students to be able to know who they're talking with and engage with each other. OK, so this is an example of the help form that we talked about. You could also have your lounge form here. And here's an example of um, just a unit one discussion board. OK, so this screenshot is of the different options. So we talked about um, you can set up grading for a discussion board. Um, this is the, descript the subscription area. And this is the area where um, you check if you don't want them to allow anonymous posts. So those are things to consider when you're setting up the discussion board. And this is what it looks like when all the students have 
um, been engaged in a discussion, you can see what's unread, you can see the total post, and then you can go in and grade and respond to those as you deem appropriate. So, um, Isabel, you had said that you use a lounge um, when you're creating discussion boards. Is there anything else that you want to share in terms of discussion boards? Okay, so you use a thread within each unit. Okay, that's great because you have a discussion for each unit and so the students are sharing information about the topics and constructing knowledge together. Okay, that's great. No, that's fine. <laughs> Okay. All right, Stephanie, that's a great idea in terms of letting students select from several discussion topics. If, if that's a viable option, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Okay, another um, tool that you can use in Blackboard is you can create a blog. So you can have an individual blog or you can have a, a class blog. And again, um, it's important not to have anonymous entries. You want to have um, students know who's sharing information to build that collaboration in the learning community. And you can index the information on the blogs. And again, it's a good idea to use a rubric. Uh, um, as I've been teaching longer, I see that students appreciate rubrics that helps them to understand the assignment expectations, how they'll be graded, and you can build those into the course. Okay, so Isabel, you said that you also provide choices. Okay. Okay, thank you for sharing that um, tip about trying to make the different topics equally exciting. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, so this is an example of a blog that you might create on Blackboard. You can see the different um, people who have posted. Okay, so here's an example of um, just a list of the blogs. Um, have you used a blog in your course, um, Isabel? Have you considered that as an option or not? Okay. Well, if you look at the um, a blog is a more, um, it's, it shows up in a different way when you're sharing information. So if we look at this screen, um, you can see how the blog looks different than the discussion board. So you can set up the um, different questions. You can set up the information that students need to um, provide. You can set up a blog for groups. So it kind of helps you to um, focus students to help them to collaborate. Um, and as Stephanie said, the individual blogs are owned by the um, individual students. And so it gives them sort of their own space. That's a great um, tip. Thank you, Stephanie. OK. Okay, and if you would like to consider, um, you know, possibly how a blog might be used, we could be, um, we could set up a consultation if you think it might be something that works in your class, Isabel. Um, but that's a good point, Stephanie, is sharing that blogs, um, it's, it's difficult to follow the threads, so if you want to follow threads in the discussion board, then, then that's a better option. Um, but it is something that you might consider. Oh, that's a good point. Um, Isabel, the point that you raise about blogs is um, we can talk about one of the tips for setting up blogs. Um, Okay, um, 
One of the tips is that um, when you're using a grading rubric, if you have the um, specific topics that you want them to address in the blog, when you set up the blog, you can sort of set up a template so that they address those topics and you have a structure and so that will help them to, instead of having the stream of consciousness, they are actually focusing on the different topics that you've um, set up for the blog. And that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Okay, so any other um, tips for the blogs, um, Stephanie? Okay, thank you. Okay, so moving on to wikis, that's another way to just use a different tool to engage students in communicating in Blackboard. You can use wikis for collaborative, asynchronous activities. Um, so you could set up a wiki and have students collect information and share information about certain topics. And the reason that we have different tools is that, you know, it keeps students engaged and they can share information, they can revise information and um, engage in different ways. And so it's, it's more interesting when they're using these different tools. And as I mentioned with the blog, you can include um, instructions on the field for how the students are to contribute. So um, you address the um, instructions and create the instructions for the wiki, then have a model for a sample page of what you expect. Um, so if you create placeholders and create wikis for the individual students and for groups, you sort of set up a structure. And when you have a structure in an online course, it helps students stay focused and it helps avert chaos. So we want to try to provide students guidelines and structures to help them be the most successful in the class. And so then they don't move on um, to topics that aren't really focused on um, the learning objectives for the course. So this is an example of a wiki and you can create um, links to different um, resources and as I said, it's just another option to um, help students engage in different ways and stay interested in the course. Okay. Um, Isabel, have you tried a wiki for um, any of your classes? Did, did that seem like an option for you or no? Okay. All right. So moving on to the journals tool. Okay, so, so that's a good idea, Isabel, that you try to use them for exchanging resources. That's an, an excellent use of a wiki. Thank you for sharing that. That's a great idea. Okay, so moving on to the journal tool, you can use journals for reflective type of activities. And we often talk about engaging students in critical thinking, trying to um, move up Bloom's taxonomy into the higher order thinking and learning. And so you can use journals to engage students and they can share their reflections. You need to decide how frequently you'll grade the journals, how many journals does it make sense to integrate with the class, and you can give overall feedback when you're grading and then um, give comments on the individual posts for the journals. So here's an example of a journal that was created for Unit 2 Reflection. That, that's a good point, um, Isabel. The point of the journals is that they are, um, information can be shared between the student and the instructor. 
And if you are trying to include a reflective component in your courses, you might have students discuss a particular topic, you might have them complete assignments, and then you might have them reflect and think about um, think about how they could apply the concepts that you talked about in class to their work or their education. Oh, you used the um, discussion board for reflections? That's fine. That's a good point. Um, there are different ways to use the different tools. And um, you know, this is just one of the options, but you, you could definitely use the discussion board for reflections as well. That's a good point. OK, so you can see that um, on the screenshot, these are private journals. So, so they're um, shared between the student and instructor. So you'd have to think about, does that make sense for the way you have designed your course? And if it makes more sense, as you said, Isabel, to um, use the discussion board for reflection, that's fine too. Um, all of these choices are based upon pedagogically what makes the most sense and which is the most effective in your particular online course. And this is an example of how you could share comments on a student's reflection. This is sort of the format that you would view in the journal. Okay, so um, Isabel, you talked about that um, Journals are, you know, you use the discussion board for reflection, and that's fine. Is there anything else on journals? OK. So Stephanie says that um, she grades the journals at the end of the semester. OK. OK, good tip. OK, that's a good tip. So you sort of see how the students um, have grown throughout the semester and their reflections as a whole. OK. Thank you for that suggestion. OK, so in terms of collaborating, we are using the Blackboard Collaborate system today for this online workshop. Have you used the Blackboard Collaborate in your course, Isabel? OK, so you've used it? OK. So some of the tips for Blackboard Collaborate are enable the chat. So we have the chat, um, which you're using um, today. OK. All right. So, so Isabel, you haven't used Blackboard Collaborate, and that's fine. If you want to consider it for future, you know, you can definitely come in here, and, and we can help you with that. But you have had the experience of, of using it today. And some of the tips are to increase the um, engagement, enable the chat for the students so they can ask questions. You can allow students to respond um, with their microphones. Um, you can set up the, the permissions so that students have microphone access. OK, um, that's a good point, Isabel. If you have um, students where they need to have maximum flexibi flexibility, then um, you know, a synchronous um, session on Blackboard Collaborate is something that you would need to carefully um, decide on a date. Um, one of the times that I use Blackboard Collaborate with my students is that um, they have to prepare research proposals for my course. And so when I'm getting ready to introduce that major assignment, I always have a synchronous session on um, Blackboard Collaborate and go over those the major assignments, the expectations, the rubric, and all that. And um, that is one option for when you're getting ready to introduce a major um, assignment. OK, yes, um, the suggestion about using Collaborate for office hours, that's a great technique. And Stephanie's suggestion about scheduling the sessions um, in NI, uh, my NIU, that's a good idea so that students know that when the sessions are scheduled, and they can schedule their time. And you can archive them and record them as well. So that would help for students who couldn't attend. Um, one of the things you can do, as we did earlier in the session, is that um, you can use real-time real polling to gauge understanding of topics. It's sort of like a formative assessment. If you get really um, comfortable, you can create breakout groups. and 
you can, as you said, Isabel, sometimes it's hard to have students online at the same time. So what you can do is you can record the session and then post it in your course so that students who are not available to come to the synchronous session can still watch the um, session. Okay, um, and Isabel, the point you make about the structure of the um, online course, you can set um, synchronous sessions, but um, it is a good idea to know, um, schedule them ahead of time, like Stephanie said, so that students know how to plan their time. And um, so you want you want to make the course as accessible as possible. So if you do host a Blackboard Collaborate synchronous session and then post the recording in the archives and share it in the course, then you've met all the students' needs, um, those that were able to come to the session and those that were not able to come to the session. Um, and you can offer chat options and question and answer options on Blackboard Collaborate. And we talked about archiving the synchronous session so that you meet everyone's needs. OK, so this is when you go into your Blackboard um, community and you create, um, you create a Blackboard session, this is, this is what the um, page looks like. So you've gone to your control panel, um, you've gone to your course tools, gone to collaboration. So then you want to um, create a session. Um, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like when um, a session is created and you want to enter the session. Um, so if you wanted to create a session, you click on this, and then you will receive a series of prompts that um, you go through to set up the session. And if you do want to use that, um, Isabel, we'd be happy to sit with you and um, help you if it's something that might work with your class. So this is what um, a Blackboard Collaborate inter um, interface looks like. You can see there's an audio setup. So if you're going to use a microphone, um, you set that up. There's video. You can use a whiteboard. You can share applications. To use a PowerPoint, you load it. Um, you can record it. So you can see that there are a lot of different options. Um, for you to use to sort of personalize your course and create synchronous opportunities for engagement. Um, any other suggestions about how you might use Blackboard Collaborate? Um, some, it's a good tool for online office hours because students can come in. Um, yes, guest speakers, that's a good idea. So you can actually have somebody um, participate from, from their office. They don't necessarily have to be in the same place as you. Um, and then it adds interest to your course. OK, so um, we're almost out of time here, but do you have any other questions in terms of communication with the Blackboard tools, Isabel? OK, but if, you know, if anything comes up, feel free to um, get a hold of me. I'm happy to help you because we do provide Blackboard support. So um, feel free to get a hold of me. OK, thank you. OK, so just to let you know, on the Blackboard, um, on the faculty development site, we have um, quite a few resources for instructors. So we have something on tips for communicating effectively using Blackboard. So you can go on there and learn about all the things we talked about today. We also have a Teaching with Blackboard site. So if you have questions about anything with Blackboard, you can look on that site, or you can get a hold of us in faculty development. We also have archives of our online programs. So today, this program was recorded, and it will be processed and archived and posted here so people who couldn't attend can view the archive later. And that's what you can also do with your synchronous Blackboard Collaborate sessions. And you can post those links in your course, and then students who couldn't attend could view them later. Um, you can also follow faculty development on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we post 
you know, notable resources and information on there. So we're happy to engage with you on social media. And again, my name is Yvonne Johnson, and I'm happy to help you. If you have any questions, just um, send me an email or give me a call. I am happy to help. And after the session, I will be sending out a, an email with an evaluation link. So if you could provide feedback on the session, that would be very helpful. OK, thank you, Isabel. Thank you so much. And um, if you want to get a hold of me later, that's great. Thank you so much. OK, so we will be signing off for now if there is no um, additional questions. Okay, thank you. Have a wonderful day as well. Bye.